This is Gockle Ridge, a mid-ocean spreading center in the North Arctic Ocean and home to one of the largest known supervolcanoes on our planet. The most recent supervolcano eruption here was approximately 1.1 million years ago, creating a caldera on the seafloor 80 kilometers long, 40 kilometers wide, and over 1.2 kilometers deep. This equates to a volume of over 3,000 cubic kilometers, making this one of the largest supervolcano eruptions ever discovered. Interestingly, Earth's North Magnetic Pole began moving from its location over Canada towards Siberia over the past 100 years, accelerating rapidly in the 1990s, and the trajectory of its movement has it passing directly through the Gockel supervolcano zone over the next 25 years or so, if it retains its velocity of 40 kilometers per year. So why exactly is this important? Well, Earth's magnetic pole in the Northern Hemisphere is where energy flows into our planet, especially during space weather events like solar coronal mass ejection impacts and geomagnetic storms. And observational evidence, in addition to cutting edge geophysics, suggests that a link exists between solar activity and earthquake and volcanic activity here on Earth. In this context, the North Magnetic Pole being situated directly over Gockel Supervolcano for the foreseeable future is a very large unknown and worth exploring in greater detail. Section 1 of this video is a basic overview of the situation. Section 2 is a deep dive into the geology and geophysics of Gockel Ridge and the Gockel Supervolcano system. And then in section three, we zoom out to examine the bigger picture of the North Magnetic Pole transiting over Gockel Supervolcano and the potential implications of this. Based on the age of the Gockel caldera, it seems that Gockel Supervolcano has been there for quite some time now. So we will begin our discussion with the active component of this equation, which is Earth's magnetic field starting with the basics. Earth's magnetic field resembles the field of a large dipole bar magnet placed near the center of our planet. So about 90% of Earth's magnetic field can be simplified down to a magnetic dipole bar magnet. Of course, it's more complex than that. There are numerous higher order poles and there are large scale anomalous features that exist on our planet. Based on these factors, among others, like space weather and geomagnetic storms, the size, shape, and strength of Earth's magnetic field changes across space and time. And this is all time scales from seconds to eons. We have geomagnetic pulsations all the way to magnetic reversals. Now, I want you to look at this red arrow and notice the direction of the magnetic force. There is energy flowing into the northern hemisphere of our planet based on the direction of these magnetic force lines. So electromagnetism is a fundamental force of nature. You have the magnetic force, you have the electric force. Here we're talking about the magnetic force and the fact that Earth's total magnetic field points inwards at the Northern Hemisphere, specifically in that Arctic Circle region at the pole, means that ions can flow down these field lines. These are electrons, these are protons, these are heavier ions. These charged particles flow in at the field lines, they flow into the polar cusp region, and they charge the area there. Now we're looking at our 2020 World Magnetic Model. This is for total field intensity or total magnetic field strength. Our contour interval is 1000 nanotesla. Those are the red lines. The thick red lines show a 5000 nanotesla contour, and you see Canada off to the left, you see Siberia off to the right. You see that 60,000 nanotesla zone for Eurasia, for Siberia, showing that the magnetic field is slightly stronger there as compared to Canada. These are two flux lobes. We'll talk about this more. In the center, you see this gray zone. This is where the horizontal magnetic field is very, very weak. And at the dip pole, you see that icon there. That is where the vertical magnetic field is 100% strength and the horizontal magnetic field is 0% strength. So there is zero force in the horizontal direction and all the force is flowing directly vertically inwards into the planet at that location. So that 
north magnetic pole has been moving across the Arctic Circle from Canada to Siberia. And I want to point out, this is very important, the magnetic pole in the northern hemisphere is actually a magnetic south pole with an inward flowing field. But since it's in the northern hemisphere and the north pole of a compass points towards this pole, we call it the north pole. So yes, it's confusing. This is actually a south pole, but because it's in the northern hemisphere and because of how we use a compass, we call it a north pole. So the south pole of the Earth dipole has been moving from the Canadian flux lobe over into Siberia. And in the process of that movement, it is accelerated recently and it's now passing directly over the Gokul Ridge supervolcano system. So what's our evidence suggesting that a supervolcano exists in the location on the planet that the North Magnetic Pole is currently moving over? Well, that would be Gokul Caldera, a massive depression on the ocean floor on the easternmost side of Gockel Ridge. This is the slowest part of Gockel Ridge, which is already the slowest mid-ocean ridge spreading center in the world. It is the northernmost end of the mid-Atlantic Ridge spreading center. And at Gockel Caldera, the spreading rates are only 10 millimeters per year or less. And it has huge dimensions. It's 80 kilometers long, 40 kilometers wide, 1.2 kilometers deep, and that is an excavation on a part of the ocean basin that's already very, very deep. So you would need tectonic forces or volcanic forces or an impact event to create a basin that large. And given the available evidence, a big supervolcano eruption is the best explanation. If we look at the bottom right, we can see that seismic reflection cross section. You see the normal lithology. Then you see just how scooped out Gogol Caldera is. Very, very anomalous. On the top right, you can see the bathymetry data for Goggle Caldera along the axis of the caldera, across the axis of the caldera. You can see just really how deep it is, how flat it is overall, and it's really a quite remarkable feature that was only first identified in 1999. Goggle Caldera is not the only evidence that we have for a supervolcano existing in this part of the Arctic Circle, but it is certainly the most striking. If we take the volume of that caldera, it's about 300,000 cubic kilometers. And this would make the Gockel supervolcano eruption approximately 1.1 million years ago, one of the largest supervolcano eruptions ever recorded. So we have the Yellowstone caldera eruption 600,000 years ago that had a volume of approximately 1,000 cubic kilometers. This is three times larger than that. We also see on our graphic the Tambora eruption of 1815, releasing about 100 cubic kilometers of material. Pinatubo of 1991 was about 10 cubic kilometers. And Mount St. Helens, a very famous eruption, 1980, one cubic kilometer of material was ejected. So Gockel Caldera and the Gockel supervolcano eruption from about 1.1 million years ago was 3,000 times larger in scale than Mount St. Helens. And it took place underneath the Arctic Ocean. So that also involved a lot of water and a lot of steam. It was a very, very explosive event. So massive in scale that there's even evidence that it altered the spreading characteristics of that part of the mid-ocean ridge in the Arctic Circle. Earth's magnetic field and the movement of the North Magnetic Pole from the Canadian flux lobe to the Siberian flux lobe is already a very interesting phenomenon. And then Gockel Ridge, Gockel Caldera, the supervolcano system there is also interesting in and of itself. But what brings this all together is the fact that Space weather events like geomagnetic storms funnel energy down the polar field lines into that part of the planet. So we're going to touch on this more in section three, but I do want to mention a couple things to lay out the overall story here, which is electromagnetism is a fundamental force. Now, what is force? Force is the capacity to do work or cause physical change energy, strength, or active power. That is the definition. So the magnetic field of our planet is a force field. It is a field of force that guides energy to certain spots versus other spots. And the magnetic pole of Earth's northern hemisphere is inward facing, meaning the force vectors point into the planet and energy flows along those paths. 
just like water flowing downstream, and soon that inward energy conduit will be situated over a supervolcano. On the right side of our graphic, we can see Earth's ionosphere, the uppermost charged part of Earth's atmosphere, and how those ionospheric potentials can change during very significant geomagnetic storms. Like those that we had in 2003, these are known as the Great Halloween Storms. They are brought on by a sequence of solar flares and coronal mass ejection impacts, the most notable being a 45X-class solar flare that occurred on the 29th, that coronal mass ejection then came in shortly afterwards, charging the overall ionosphere, triggering a very severe geomagnetic storm. And so an event like that, which happens during solar maximum or on the declining phase of solar maximum, like we're about to go through with solar cycle 25, can bring a lot of energy into the Earth system and a lot of that energy will flow down the polar field cusp, specifically the northern hemisphere polar cusp because that is where the field is inward facing and soon that polar cusp for the northern hemisphere will be over Gockel Ridge and that super volcano system. So we will expand on that in section three. Now let's look specifically at Gockel Ridge, the geology, the geophysics, and what we've learned about this part of the planet that just recently was completely unknown and undiscovered, but now there is a lot of active research and exploration going into it. We'll begin this section on Gockel Ridge and the Gockel Supervolcano with this overview graphic here. We see Greenland off to the left. Down below are a sequence of islands. You have Svalbard, you have Severnaya Zemlya. You see the black triangles. Those are seismic stations. Right in the center is Gockel Ridge. You see Gockel Caldera all the way off to the right, to the east. That's the furthest end of the Gockel Ridge spreading center. You see a red star. That is the location of a earthquake swarm that occurred in 1999. Now, Gockel Ridge is the 1800 kilometer long northernmost end of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge system, which is a volcanic spreading center that splits the planet in two, running all the way from near Antarctica to Gockel Caldera. Gockel Caldera is the very end of the line, and it has the slowest spreading rates of the entire mid-oceanic ridge system. So at Gockel Ridge, it's about 14.6 millimeters per year. At Gockel Caldera, it's all the way down to 6.3 millimeters per year. Now in 1999, the highest magnitude and longest duration earthquake swarm on a mid-ocean ridge ever was observed along Gockel Ridge. This was 15 events that were greater than magnitude 5, 252 earthquakes that were globally observed, and it lasted all the way from January to September of 1999, so nearly nine months. These high magnitude pulses created extension deep within this part of the lithosphere and it liberated magma from depth and erupted explosively along the sea floor. This eruption site was surveyed in 2007 by the Agave Expedition. Eight dives were done across Odin and Loki volcanoes. They found extensive pyroclastic deposits showing that the eruption was equivalent in scale to large terrestrial volcanic eruptions. And explosive eruptions are rare on ocean ridges, particularly at depths below the critical depth for steam, which is 3,000 meters. So this Earthquake swarm in 1999 in the volcanic eruption that was surveyed is highly anomalous in and of itself. And this was a very small volcanic eruption compared to what created Gockel Caldera. Along normal ocean ridges like the rest of the mid-Atlantic spreading center, there is an active release of energy. The spreading is always occurring. But at places like Gockel Ridge, there is a slower spreading. So there's a slower release of that convective mantle energy. And as you go all the way to Gockel Caldera, you start to get ultra slow spreading rates and you have that caldera matched with it, showing that it functions differently than normal spreading centers. There is a different time scale of energy release. You have a storage and then a rare mass release event. So energy is sequestered and stored over long geologic timescales before it finally violently erupts, creating things like Gockel Caldera. We don't know if this is going to continue, 
any super volcano, any sort of volcanic system is active or can become inactive. So there is evidence of activity based on that 1999 earthquake swarm and volcanic event. We will look at those details next. Here we have data showing recent seismic activity along Gawker Ridge. Down below in color, we have the earthquake activity from December 2016 to January 2020. And then the other graphics to the right are for the seismic swarm of 1999. Now the global network recorded a swarm of earthquakes from January through September of 1999 consisting of 252 earthquakes, 3.2 to 5.8 in magnitude. Keep in mind, the global network can only record earthquakes of a certain magnitude. So there were certainly more earthquakes in this that were sub 3.2 in magnitude. And this swarm was the largest earthquake swarm ever observed along a mid-ocean ridge. The slow migration of the largest magnitude events along the axis of the Rift Valley suggests that multiple magmatic pulses occurred from mantle depth. Remember, spreading rates here are as low as 6 millimeters per year. Off in the top right, you can see how there is that flurry of activity from January to April, two events per day, and then it reduced down to about one event every other day. And you can see at the bottom right how there was a sequence of high magnitude earthquakes, all greater than five, uh, and it actually lasted all the way to about June. So the Magnitude 5 and greater earthquakes were distributed out across about a six month time scale, whereas the lower magnitude earthquakes were more clustered towards the beginning. They opened up and fractured that area, allowing for those magmatic pulses to occur. And so when this earthquake swarm was observed, a lot of researchers wanted to then survey the site, which is what they did later, and they found extensive pyroclastic deposits and other unique geologic features. We will be looking at that more in depth. Now, if we look at the bottom graphic, we see our 1.5 to 6 magnitude earthquake distribution from December 2016 to January 2020. And you'll see that normal part of Gockel Ridge off to the left. That westernmost side of Gockel Ridge is where you have the most spreading. You can actually see that spreading center very well with the bathymetry data. You see how there's a lot of earthquakes associated with that, mostly low magnitude. That is normal for a spreading center, but we see this anomalous zone. I circled it there in yellow, where you don't really have a rift valley. You don't really have an active spreading center. It's quite a bit less than it is for that western part of Gawkel Ridge but there was a big clustering of earthquakes that occurred there from this time period. Specifically, it was in 2018, I think it was February, and we see a big, big, big push of earthquake activity in that area. Some of those earthquakes were quite large too, and then if you go even further east to Gockel Caldera, you see that on the very far uh, right of that graphic, you see there was only one earthquake there that was recorded by this earthquake observatory system, a few others, a little bit to the west of it, but you have that anomalous earthquake zone. So that could be a new pocket of volcanic activity related to the Gockel supervolcano. It's in a location that has a very low spreading rate, and that's actually the exact location that it appears Earth's north magnetic pole is moving towards. Before going more in depth on the unique volcanic characteristics of Gockel Ridge and the overall Gockel supervolcano system, Let's look at what they found from that 1999 earthquake swarm and volcanic eruption that occurred. On the top left, we see these high standing weathered pillow basalts. They are the rock that is light gray in color. And on top of them, you see that fine pyroclastic material. On the top right of the screen, you see that pyroclastic material zoomed in up close. That's a five millimeter scale right there. Very glassy, very granular, a lot of air bubbles trapped within. And remember, this is occurring at depths below the critical threshold for steam, that's 3,000 meters. So you require more gas concentration than you normally would to create this type of pyroclastic material to have this type of explosive eruption. On the bottom right of the screen, we get a close-up view of that glass, some of the bubbles that are contained within it. And then on the bottom left of the screen, you see the talus blocks that perhaps represent the ejecta from this explosion on Odin Volcano. So talus blocks is like the scree blocks that surround a volcano after it's erupted. 
So these are very, very large talus blocks and they were scattered all along the rim and the outside of Odin Volcano. So a very large eruption occurred here. Also the other volcanoes, perhaps it actually created Odin Volcano. That seems to be the most likely. There wasn't extensive high resolution bathymetry data done for this part of the Arctic Circle multiple times. So it's possible that this is a new volcanic system that was formed, Odin, Thor, and Loki. And we see that it has very anomalous characteristics for an underwater eruption with this pyroclastic material. In this graphic, we see a model for how this volcanic eruption occurred based on the available seismic data, geochemical data, geologic data. And on the bottom right of the screen, we see the bathymetry data for this area in particular. So you see Odin, Thor, and Loki volcanoes. And what the model is, is that the athenosphere is welling up here and there's a high amount of dissolved CO2 within it. This, as it wells up towards the surface, it creates a semi-brittle shear zone. Of course, there's a lot of water saturation that's going down from the crust. You also have water saturation going up and you have CO2 saturation going up. This creates a degassing in the steady magma reservoir that exists there. And then that can have a rapid degassing effect leading upwards, causing explosive volcanism. So explosive that can actually lead to the creation of pyroclastic deposits. So the actual oceanic crust is made up of gabbro. It's made up of basalt. It's highly fractured. You know, there's a lot of extension that occurs there. This is a spreading center, which weakens the crust already, making this type of volcanism more likely. But it's the unique characteristics of Gockel Ridge that leads to this explosive volcanism. And we don't observe this happening on other parts of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge spreading system or other mid-ocean ridges in general. This is a very unique volcanic situation that we have in play in the Arctic Circle. And that's why it's worth noting the movement of that force vector, that north magnetic pole over the Gockel supervolcano. Let's go even more in depth with this graphic here. In the top left, we see our overall location in the Arctic Circle, our bathymetry map. Down below, we have the bathymetry map for Odin, Thor, and Loki volcanoes. Then on the bottom, we have some different seismic cross sections. This is a velocity of the P wave compared to the velocity of the shear wave ratio. So I will discuss what that means. Now, Gockel Ridge is characterized by high volcanic and geothermal activity in discrete zones separated by long amagmatic sections. So you have these areas that are highly volcanic and then you have these areas which are anomalously not volcanic. Anomalously low temperatures and low melting degrees lead to a high concentration of volatiles, which in turn lead to exceptionally strong explosive eruptions along the ridge. And at least 13.5% CO2 by weight is necessary to fragment magma at these depths, which is about tenfold the highest values previously measured in a mid-ocean ridge basalt. So very anomalous, very strange, very unique. Accumulation of a large volume of volatiles in the upper layer of a crustal magma chamber provides the most plausible mechanism for deep fragmentation. And an active degassing of volatiles from the rising decompressing melts leads to abrupt volume changes, creates fractures marked by deep seismicity along an inclined zone. That's exactly what we saw with that 1999 earthquake swarm. You can see there in red the earthquakes distributed along that incline fault zone. So the high pressure magma in the reservoir is lightened by all these bubbles, by the huge amount of CO2. It breaks its self-sealed zone, that cap, escapes the surface and produces an explosive eruption and releases a large amount of gas. And that is with that 1999 earthquake swarm and volcanic event on Odin, Thor, and Loki. So if we look at the bottom right of the screen, we see two different maps. And what I really want you to look at is the red colors. That is where the velocity of the P wave, the compressional wave, is two times higher than the velocity of the shear wave. And what that effectively means is that 
When you have lower shear wave velocities, you have more liquids. Shear waves don't like to travel through liquid. So when shear wave velocities are lower, you're gonna have a greater flow and liquidity to things. So when you have that red color, which is uh, above that ratio of two, that's showing a very high ratio of compressional waves to shear waves, indicating that presence of magma, liquid magma near the surface. So you see the one location, then you see the two location. So you have magma near the surface, then you also have that reservoir a little bit lower down at depth. And you can see with the bottom right how that zone of low shear wave velocity is spread out across this volcanic center. So this is effectively indicating the size of that magmatic reservoir that exists just for this location. And it's quite large, and this is only a small section of Gockel Ridge. Gockel Caldera is much larger than this and indicates that there could be magmatic reservoirs that exist in this part of the Arctic Circle, which are much, much larger, but maybe they are inactive at this moment in time, or maybe we just haven't gathered evidence of their existence yet. We haven't been monitoring this part of the world for that long. We just recently put in seismic stations nearby on those islands. We did see that area of anomalous seismic activity that I discussed earlier. That could be one of these magmatic centers just now being identified that's linked to Gokul supervolcano. Another piece in this complex puzzle is the fact that gravity anomalies exist along Gokul Ridge. So the ridge axis at Gokul Ridge is unusually deep and large amplitude free water anomalies are observed over the axis of the Gokul Ridge with peak to trough amplitudes of 85 to 150 milligals. Milligals are a measure of gravity and these anomalies are 1.5 to two times larger than those observed over portions of the mid-Atlantic ridge with comparable bathymetric relief, suggesting that the crust is either atypically dense or atypically thin. So they created some models from this gravity data and it's compatible with either thin normal density crust or thicker high density crust. Thin normal density crust can be interpreted as a thin layer of basaltic volcanics overlaying on the deforming mantle, or thicker high density crust can be interpreted as a carapace of serpentinized mantle. In either case, it is possible that large areas of the seafloor on the Gockel Ridge may consist of exposed mantle with only thin sediments. So there's no normal oceanic crust here. It's either very, very thin or it's atypically dense, or it may even just be Earth's mantle exposed directly at the surface, which is extremely anomalous and rare and was nothing that anyone was expecting when they first discovered Gockel Ridge. The estimate for the thickness of the crust at Gockel Ridge based on the gravity anomalies is one to four kilometers thick, and that's considerably less than the seismic determinations of six to seven kilometer thick oceanic crust characteristic to normal oceanic settings. So your normal oceanic crust is six to seven kilometers thick and at Gockel Ridge it's one to four kilometers thick. It's even thinner at Gockel Caldera where you had 3,000 kilometers of volume ejected out. There it's anomalously thin and there may be large portions of the seafloor at Gockel Ridge and in that area that consists of exposed mantle directly at the surface. On the left side of this graphic, we see some of the deformed geology for this area near the Gockel Caldera. Up top are late Cretaceous rocks from 100 to 66 million years ago. Down below are Oligocene, Miocene rocks from approximately 23 million years ago. You can see how warped they are, how folded they are. There are also extensive methane sinkholes and emissions all across this area, all across northern Siberia, which may be linked to this larger volcanic system that exists. If you look to the right, you will see an area that's circled yellow. That is an area of regional basement uplift that has a magnetic anomaly 200 nanotesla in strength. So that is off to the southeast of Gockel supervolcano caldera. We see that 1999 and 2018 seismic swarm 
to the north of the caldera. And if you look at the top right of the graph, you can see the north magnetic pole and its movement across time. So in yellow, 2007, that's the last direct observation of the north magnetic pole. And then we have the modeled location of the magnetic north pole for 2015, 2020, and expected 2025 there in green. So you see the movement of the north magnetic pole from near Canada towards this part of Gockel Ridge, the area of Gockel Ridge that has the lowest spreading rates and the most seismic and volcanic activity. It has evidence of that past supervolcano eruption with the caldera. And then even further south, we have that area of regional basement uplift, that magnetic anomaly. And we also have borehole geologic evidence from about 1,000 kilometers away from the caldera, which show that there are regular periods of enhanced volcanic activity and there's also a key signature for that supervolcanic eruption 1.1 million years ago. The main evidence that we have for a supervolcano eruption along Gockel Ridge is Gockel Caldera itself, but we do have supporting evidence from seafloor core KD12-03-10 C. Now this is a six meter long sedimentation core that was extracted from the Mendeleev rise in 2012 and it represents a time interval of about 4 million years from the Pliocene to the Quaternary. This seafloor core is really important supporting evidence for the existence of a supervolcano along Gockel Ridge in that supervolcano eruption 1.1 million years ago because it shows a pronounced episode of volcanic activity that took place 1.09 million years ago. We see the magnetic susceptibility at that moment in time leaped up, really strongly increased, it's circled in red there, and this data point of 1.09 million years ago is very close to the time of formation of the caldera of about 1 million years, which is derived from the width of the Rift Valley on the caldera floor, that's 10 kilometers, and its approximate spreading rate of one centimeter per year. Now magnetic susceptibility is effectively looking at how susceptible to magnetic fields this sediment is. It's showing a higher percentage of magnetic materials like iron, like magnetite, and this core is extracted about 1,000 kilometers away from the caldera. So to see this dramatic increase in the magnetic susceptibility shows that this was a very, very large eruption that took place, large enough to deposit these iron-bearing sediments nearly 1,000 kilometers away as extracted with KD120310C. So we also see other increases in magnetic susceptibility. We see a really pronounced one back about 2.5 million years ago. We see some smaller increases in magnetic susceptibility uh, circled in yellow there. We also see changes in the intensity, which line up nicely with those increases in susceptibility. And what this shows is that there have been multiple episodes of volcanic activity for this part of the world. Some of them may have been smaller or further away because the susceptibility values are less, but really the susceptibility value that stands out the most is the one that is dated at 1.09 million years ago, which lines up perfectly with the caldera formation itself. Something else that is interesting to note is the fact that during that spike in magnetic susceptibility 1.09 million years ago, during that supervolcano eruption, we see a sequence of magnetic reversals on Earth. So we have our Kron's data, the black and white bars, and we see that Earth's magnetic field went through a sequence of reversals. Of course, this is geologic time over the course of millions of years, but they weren't these long stretches of stable magnetic field conditions. We had some rapid shifts in Earth's magnetic field. And if we go to that other bump in magnetic susceptibility about 2.5 million years ago, we also see that Earth's magnetic field underwent a reversal near that time. So this is indicating that this supervolcano system that's located near the North Pole may be connected to magnetic reversals. Of course, we need a lot more data and a lot more evidence to really flesh out that idea, this hypothesis, but it is certainly something to consider. It makes sense because that magnetic pole where you have that force vector is gonna be very important. And so if you have 
a large change in conductivity there because of increased magma, or you have some sort of massive volcanic eruption, a super volcano event, then perhaps that is strong enough to alter Earth's magnetic field, or perhaps it's the reversal of Earth's magnetic field which changes the energy dynamics of this super volcano system, causing it to explode. Welcome to section three. Here we will focus more on the movement of the North Magnetic Pole and what this means for the overall energy dynamics on our planet and relate that to the Gockel Ridge supervolcano system. So here with this graphic, we see the movement of the magnetic North Pole in between flux lobes. So the North Magnetic Pole is simply the location on Earth's surface where the magnetic field is exactly perpendicular to the ground surface. The horizontal magnetic field is zero in strength. Two flux lobes of greatest total magnetic field strength exist in the Arctic Circle, one over Canada and one over Russia. On the bottom left, we can zoom out and look at Earth's magnetic field and we see these polar cusps coming out of the North and the South Pole. But effectively what happens is in the Northern Hemisphere, that polar cusp, that funnel, which allows energy to flow in, splits into two. And from 1999 to 2019, those two flux lobes have actually undergone quite a lot of change. The Canadian flux lobe has become smaller and the Siberian flux lobe has become bigger and stronger. This change in the flux lobes of the Northern Hemisphere is the leading theory explaining why the North Magnetic Pole has been moving so much recently and why it's been accelerating as of late. And that's because the North Magnetic Pole would want to go to the area of strongest field strength. And right now that is over Siberia. That flux lobe is growing and thus the magnetic pole is moving that direction. Remember the North Magnetic Pole is just the part of the field with the expression of zero horizontal strength and 100% vertical strength. So it's not the full story. It's just one location in space time. It's very important of course but the magnetic field is much more complex than that. There's magnetohydrodynamics, how the magnetic field propagates through the mantle. It's very, very complex. So we're seeing a quick movement of the North Magnetic Pole from the Canadian flux lobe to the Siberian flux lobe. And in that process, it's passing right over Gockel Ridge in that Gockel supervolcano system. There is also evidence that suggests that this movement of the North Magnetic Pole in between these flux lobes occurs fairly regularly in geologic time on about a 1,000 to 5,000 year time scale. So the further back in time you go, the fuzzier things get, but we do have evidence that the North Magnetic Pole has moved over this region multiple times. Of course, it's always doing that on some time scale, but it happens at a fairly regular 1,000 year, 2,000, 3,000 year time scale. And so it's not like the movement of this North Magnetic Pole over Gockel Ridge is imminently going to guarantee a super volcano eruption, but it is repositioning that force field and that flow of energy into that area that already is a large energy reservoir and has those mass release events with those massive super volcano eruptions. In December of 2023, a new report was released called State of the Geomagnetic Field. And this report looked at Earth's magnetic field changes over time, specifically for the past few years. And there are a couple interesting things to point out here. First is that they noticed that the acceleration of the North Magnetic Pole actually went down back in 2015 through 2020. The velocity of movement for the North Pole was about 50 kilometers per year, but you see off to the right, circled in red, how that decreased to about 41 kilometers per year. This is all based on different models. No one's actually located the exact position of the North Magnetic Pole using a vertical dip compass since 2007, but these models are becoming more precise with time. So it appears that the movement of the North Magnetic Pole is starting to slow down a little bit to about 40 kilometers per year. We'll see if it maintains that or if it continues to deaccelerate. But what this means is that at a velocity of 40 kilometers per year, it's going to take about 25 years for the North Magnetic Pole to transit over the Gockel Ridge area, that basin that contains that supervolcano. We have about a 25 year time period here 
if everything is to maintain itself, if the north magnetic pole is to continue moving at this velocity in this direction, that we will have this increase of energy flux over this part of the planet that has this large energy reservoir contained within it. Here we have a map showing the location of the North Magnetic Pole across time and also in relation spatially to the Gockel Ridge, Gockel Caldera, and that 1999 earthquake swarm and volcanic event. We have the yellow squares representing the actual locations of the magnetic pole when they were measured. 2007 is the last direct measurement using a dip compass. Since then we've used models those are shown with those orange circles, and we see 2010, 2015, 2020, 2025 in red. Now we can see that the North Magnetic Pole was moving over Canada fairly slowly. We have good actual locations for that from 1948 to 1994, and then it accelerated in the 90s, moving very rapidly over the Arctic Basin, and now on a collision course for Gockel Ridge and the supervolcano system that is hidden there. I want to really briefly highlight that we don't know exactly what creates Earth's magnetic field. There does appear to be some sort of geodynamo in effect creating this magnetic field in the outer core because we see that the shear wave velocities go to near zero at that boundary from about 3,000 to 5,000 kilometers in depth. But there also could be nuclear fission georeactors in the deep inner core that also create magnetic fields due to the movement of these ions. And this could also explain magnetic reversals, magnetic excursions. So there's a lot of complex geophysics at play within Earth's interior, within Earth's mantle, that changes the expression of Earth's magnetic field. So there's a lot that we don't know. We haven't gone to the mantle, we haven't gone to the core, so it's based on indirect measurements. But some of the best measurements we can get are of the magnetic field at the surface, and we do see that moving rapidly over Gockel Ridge. Here we have a graphic going more in depth on the geodynamo of the outer core, but I really want to direct your attention to the top of the graphic on the right, which has those field lines going into the outer core, past the inner core. Notice the direction on those field lines. They're pointed inwards. That is the northern hemisphere. The fields point into our planet. Energy flow comes into our planet. So across geologic time, when you have the sun releasing a lot of energy out into interplanetary space. Earth's magnetic field connects to the interplanetary magnetic field. That flow of energy from the sun and from other outside forces will go down those field lines, down into the planet, and perhaps it is an important aspect of sustaining this outer core geodynamo. At least it's definitely connected because these energy flows are significant across geologic time. So it is worth mentioning the fact that our North Magnetic Pole, the funnel that is the strongest in collecting and guiding these energies, is moving over Gockel Ridge and that supervolcano system. I would like to acknowledge that there is so much more that we don't know about our planet than we do know and that we are going to be learning a tremendous amount about the Earth, its geophysics, and how its energetic systems connect to the Sun, connect to the solar system and the galaxy at large over the next 50, 100 plus years. So keep that in mind. But there are a few observational things that we are learning about our planet. For example, Earthquakes are often accompanied by electromagnetic disturbances, such as earthquake lightning, radio emissions, changes in atmospheric conductivity, and more. So there is evidence that suggests that electrification of geologic structures occurs under high pressures due to piezoelectric effects. This is where you apply mechanical pressure or stress to something and emits an electric current. And there is even the possibility of plasma formation in geologic structures. To the right, we have a graphic that I created showing the connection between outside energy input like X-rays from a solar flare or enhanced proton flux like from a coronal mass ejection impact on our planet. So as you have this energy come in, it interacts with our ionosphere, the uppermost charged part of our atmosphere, and these new energy inputs enhance ionospheric currents. 
Now these ionosphere currents have a time varying component. They are alternating currents many times. So they generate these geomagnetic pulsations, which are typically sub five Hertz. These geomagnetic pulsations being of such a low frequency, they have enormous wavelengths and very little attenuation. They pierce through the atmosphere no problem, and they are able to pierce deeply into Earth's crust down to 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers, 20 kilometers or more depending on their frequency. For example, the lowest frequency ones can go down to like 15, 20 kilometers, and that is where those fault zones exist. That is where earthquakes rupture, and at those depths, these geomagnetic pulsations induce telluric currents of significant strength. So there is a connection between solar activity and earthquakes. Earthquakes occur more often when solar activity levels dramatically change. For example, the number of global earthquakes greater than magnitude four increased by 68% after a 9.3 X-class flare on September 6, 2017. You can see that data up top. You see the 11 day window for before the X-class flare. You see the 11 day window afterwards. You see that earthquakes went up by about 68%, nearly doubled, especially in the couple days immediately preceding. And what this shows is that strong space weather like X-class solar flares and coronal mass ejection impacts they trigger these short period oscillations of Earth's geomagnetic field, these geomagnetic pulsations, which induce the largest amplitude to lurk currents in Earth's lithosphere, especially in the most conductive areas, such as mature geologic faults under high stress where that piezoelectric effect is in place. So geomagnetic pulsations sub 0.1 Hertz travel deep into the crust, greater than 15 kilometers, based on a resistivity value of 100 ohms. Two earthquake source locations, they induce to lurk currents there at strengths of about 10 to negative six amps per square meter. And these periodic geomagnetic disturbances that we get from strong solar flares, from coronal mass ejection impacts, seem to initiate relatively weak earthquake swarms. Now this occurs because these faults are under high stress. They'll be tripped over by this incoming energy, but it also seems to limit excessively high tectonic stresses from accumulating because when you have that energy coming in, it trips a lot of those faults. You get these magnitude four, magnitude five earthquakes. They increase in frequency, but stops those big earthquakes from building up their energy and then releasing. So the most catastrophic earthquakes and volcanic eruptions usually occur during periods of low solar activity, not during heightened solar activity, because that solar activity comes in and destabilizes the weak faults and releases some of those weak earthquakes, but the strong ones really require those long loading periods, especially when there's coronal holes on the sun. Those seem to trigger very powerful earthquakes because they're very large extended duration energy loader. So what does this mean for Gockel Ridge? Well, we are entering into solar maximum for solar cycle 25 or right at the beginning of solar maximum. We're gonna be on the declining phase of that. The North Magnetic Pole is moving over Gockel Ridge for about the next 25 years or so. We'll have a couple solar cycles during that time period. So we can expect more earthquake activity over Gockel Ridge, especially if it's centered around increased solar activity, let's say from a very strong flare or coronal mass ejection impact, but perhaps these are gonna be lower magnitude earthquake swarms. It's impossible to say whether or not there's gonna be any sort of super volcano eruption. I think that's guided and determined by completely different larger factors, but certainly the location of Earth's North Magnetic Pole moving over that zone is something to be aware of. If we get really strong solar activity, we could see some larger changes take place because of the huge increase of energy flux to that location. There's a lot that we don't know. There's a little that we do. I hope I discuss pretty adequately the little that we do know and also some future directions for the field of geophysics for this new part of the planet that we're just now starting to really discover and realize through bathymetric mapping and through seismic surveys and through gravity surveys, magnetic surveys. 
So I will keep you informed as to what's happening for our planet energetically, geophysically. If you subscribe to my channel, I release regular updates. I hope to see you there. Earth's magnetic field was a central topic in today's video. And if you want to deepen your knowledge about the energetics of our planet, I have Earth's magnetic field master guide available to you. This is a two hour course with a bunch of different topics under discussion from Earth's core and the geodynamo to Earth's plasma sphere, geomagnetic storms, also things like geomagnetic excursions, reversals. So if you want a comprehensive guide on Earth's magnetic field, then my Earth's Magnetic Field Master Guide is the best resource for you. It's available on Gumroad as a one-time purchase ad-free, or it's also available ad-free for special channel members. You can sign up by going to my channel page and clicking join. I've been your host, Stefan Burns. Thank you all so much for watching this video. I hope you found it informative, useful, interesting. I know that in the process of learning about Gockel Ridge, Gockel Supervolcano, the movement of the North Magnetic Pole, my curiosity was deeply stimulated. I have all the research papers that I read to create this video linked in the video description. So if you'd like to learn more, I recommend you do your own research. All those papers are provided. I do my best to summarize those, distill them down, and present that information to you as factually and accurately as possible but you can also do your own deeper research using those links. So I hope you find that of value. Please comment below what you think about this, what you think about the movement of the North Magnetic Pole, what you think about Gockel Ridge, how the two combining is an interesting energetic phenomenon. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Let's start a discussion about this. This is one of the larger energetic transits in play for the next 20, 25, 30 years. It's something that we should all be aware of and we should be discussing and analyzing and learning more about in the years ahead. Again, thank you all so much for watching. If you'd like to stay up to date about what's happening energetically on our planet, then you can subscribe to my channel. I release regular updates for you, both in terms of daily events and then also larger synopsis views like this video here. Wishing you all well. Again, I've been your host, Stefan Burns, and I'll see you all in the next video.